My guest is Justin Papadakis. He is the COO and Chief Real Estate Officer for the United Soccer League, better known as the USL. Justin, thanks for joining me on Sports Business Radio. How are you? Thanks, Brian. Glad to be here. So, all right, let's start with that. Um, Chief Real Estate Officer. I've hosted this show 18 years. I'm not sure I've seen someone with that title, but it's become so much more important when you build a stadium now or an arena that it's part of a bigger master plan. You're not just sticking them out in the middle of nowhere. Most times it's part of a bigger economic development. Um, You have a great background in real estate. So how is that helping the USL? So Brian, we've really taken real estate as part of our core strategy. And so when we look at, building a stadium, what we really think about is how to build a stadium anchored entertainment district. That can mean different uh, shapes and sizes and different component parts to the development in different markets. But it's something we really, really think about. When we look in a core part of our growth strategy and what's different um, from every other league uh, in in the United States and, and likely around the world, is that we've taken an approach where the league um, has gone out you know, for the past six or seven years and gone into markets and you know, just really blessed having an amazing real estate team of people uh, that we work on you know, 35 to 40 markets at once. And we'll go in and work with our, our city, county, state partners, uh, the soccer community, the business community, the philanthropic community, all these stakeholders that are necessary to get a stadium anchor development project uh, over the line and work with them for, you know, one to five plus years on identifying the land, getting it entitled, getting the financing package together, putting the different component parts of the real estate deal together. And then we'll go out and, and select an owner Uh, that will ultimately own the team and develop the real estate uh, to take to uh, be the steward uh, thereafter. And so it's uh, definitely what we're most proud of as as a league is uh, one, getting to have and see the transformational change um, in, because we really try to focus on kind of the, the, the inner city um, where we can drive, uh, jobs and economic impact. Um, And then, you know, as a result of that, we create really sustainable teams uh, that have great economics that enable us uh, to keep growing from an asset value um, and keep growing in terms of number of really high performing franchises uh, around the country. So as far as my research tells me, the USL is aiming to have 80 professional clubs within the next three to four years. This is men and women. When you're looking at ownership groups, size of stadium, like what are some of the key elements you're looking for when you are looking for expansion? So I think where we'll end up is probably 35 uh, in the championship, 35 in league one. And then our super league, which is our women's uh, uh, property will come on top of that. So you know, I think we'll have about 70 plus markets, um, which could have a uh, hundred plus teams because you, the, the our women's uh, franchises uh, will be, you know, doubling up on, on a lot of those markets. And that's so exciting. Um, again, what we're most proud of uh, beyond the economic impact is that we're creating thousands of professional playing jobs, coaching jobs, front office jobs. Um, that really enable the soccer ecosystem and you need an ecosystem for a sport to develop. And it's so important that in markets outside of the top 30 markets that they can see professional women's uh, men's and women's soccer in a first class venue week in and week out. And then it's their team. Um, So that's what we really try to think about is how to create these great stadiums, have great fan bases, and every week um, you have this soundtrack to a soccer game and excitement around a soccer game that, you know, I, a little bias, I don't think exists in other sports. Um, and 
that's where I think you're seeing this massive growth in soccer. And it'll be so much fun uh, with the World Cup coming to the United States in 2026. When you bookend 2026 versus 1994, which was really meant to kickstart professional soccer in the United States, when the whole soccer community looks between the, the USL, the MLS, the NWSL, soccer is going to be in such a magnificent place. And we're so proud uh, to be a part of, you know, building the game here uh, in the United States. Yeah, I mean, in the U.S., you've got football, you've got basketball, you've got baseball, but soccer is closing in quickly on baseball as the third most popular sport in the U.S. So you're right. In 1994, you know, soccer in the United States wasn't in that top five. But now you look at the landscape and it's really changed. It has. And we have unique dynamics to soccer, which makes it so exciting. So to, outside of soccer, um, you have this major minor league construct, right? Where take baseball, you have the major league teams and you have the minor league teams. And the minor league team's goal is to rehab injury, develop players for the major league. Soccer is different. Um, and so, one, we have teams on a week in, week out basis that might draw more than the MLS teams. Um, they have bigger stadiums, generally speaking. They have higher budgets um, across the board than us, but we have um, soccer uh, uh, dynamic in the United States where we, our teams can be very competitive and we don't position ourselves as minor league. So we also play them in a tournament every year. And so we're coming up uh, in uh, the next week or two um, for a final of the Open Cup, which is where we play the MLS. And of all the USL teams and all the MLS teams, a USL team is playing an MLS team in the final. And again, that just wouldn't happen in any other sport. Right. It makes soccer unique. And we're looking to um, work with our owners in the next couple of years to look at really adding a whole nother level uh, to the interest level of soccer by looking at things like promotion relegation. And so these are concepts that um, we, we, try to, we try to make USL different. But most importantly, what we try to do is really be the, the club of our local markets, right? And so um, it's not supporting the bigger city, you know, three or four hours away. It's having your own professional club that you can go on ESPN Plus and you can watch a championship team, a USL championship, USL League One M or, or MLS. You can watch all those on kind of equal billing. And so I think everyone's really responded to that. Um, and again, that's what drove fan interest. And I think that's what really drove uh, partner, you know, corporate partner interest and what's driving the ownership interest um, in soccer and particularly the USL because we are able to engage, uh, engage our communities in such a kind of fundamental way. In addition, again, to kind of the real estate side, which helps drive fan interest because you're not only going to a game, you're going to a development typically. Um, so it's a whole night of, of holistic entertainment. For our audience who isn't familiar with franchise values for USL teams, again, I know you're talking about packaging this in with real estate, um, mm -hmm. MLS franchise values, and even NWSL franchise values have skyrocketed in the last five to 10 years. What's the average price of a USL franchise? Just ballpark. So people have some idea. So first, let me tell you about where we were. Uh, 10 years ago when this management team took over the USL. Okay. You know, teams were about fifty, seventy-five hundred thousand dollars Okay. Um, we played in high school stadiums. Um, you know, they it it really was kind of a quasi adult league plus type of, of of league. Fast forward, now we have two and a half billion dollars of stadium anchor development. Uh, another $2 billion of stadium anchor, anchor development coming uh, before the end of the year. Um, and now teams are trading 
uh, depending on our leagues. We have League One and Championship um, and soon to be Super League. Um, teams are trading at 20 to 70 plus million. And so uh, that's where the values like our, you know, our friends at the MLS and NWSL, we've seen a continuous year over year uh, drive in terms of asset value. And uh, what's most exciting about uh, that, even though we're up into the, you know, 20 to 70 million, we re- and that excludes real estate. Okay. Um, what is most exciting about that is we really haven't hit the major revenue verticals uh, for pro soccer teams. So when you think about, you know, media deal, uh, we have a great, you know, partnership with ESPN now, um, as we look forward, now that we've proved ourselves, uh, we've proved our audience base, um, the media side will become a significant portion of our revenue like it is for other sports. When you look at sports betting, that's just starting to have a flow down effect in terms of team economics. You won't really see that in full effect probably for another two or three years. Player transfers. Um, so for those that aren't uh, you know, uh, familiar with soccer, in the other sports, baseball, basketball, football, hockey, you trade players. In soccer, you sell players, or in soccer parlance, you transfer players. And so um, in worldwide, you know, particularly European soccer, those transfers will be 10, 20, 30, 50, all the way up to 300 plus million dollars. Um, for the USL, players have uh, that the transfer market was very, very nascent. But this uh, recently, we've had our first $750,000 transfer. Likely, we'll have our first, hopefully, million dollar transfer by the end of the year. And so it builds on itself. The MLS is spending more on transfers, which will be a great domestic, you know, uh, source of uh, 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 buying for us. Uh, but we we operate on a worldwide transfer market. And so we uh, a little biased, but I think the United States produces the best athletes in the world. We just haven't developed them right for soccer. But that has totally changed now. Our teams are creating really strong academies. We're building great training uh, centers. And they get to play in amazing venues on ESPN Plus in front of five, 10, 12,000 people week in and week out. And so players have a great playing experience. That's only going to get better um, as we keep growing our footprint. We keep adding more markets underneath our academy structure uh, because talent's evenly distributed. The best players don't just grow up in Atlanta. I mean, in, in New York, Atlanta, in L.A., you, they come from everywhere. And so the more markets that we have, the more that we'll be able to offer those players a great development uh, pathway. And over the years, you'll start to see, you know, uh, more Christian politics start to come through because we've really solved the development uh, pathway for soccer players in the United States. And so that's so exciting to be able to see, again, how that, that's going to translate to success at the World Cups. And it's also going to translate into more resources through transfers coming in that our teams will then recycle back into the development process um, so that uh, so that they we can just keep producing better players through better facilities, coaches, et cetera. What's the ideal stadium size as you create the stadium of the future you mentioned before five ten twelve thousand as an audience for these matches but you know it's interesting i've seen especially like in arenas they're scaling back to become more intimate instead of oh we need you know 20 22,000 we'd rather have 16 or 17,000 with some places you can stand and uh, have a drink and, and things like that is you're kind of creating the stadium experience going forward. What does that look like? It's a great question. It's something that we think about and it definitely is an iterative process because how fans are consuming sports and line in live entertainment is changing, uh, changing every year. 
and so from a um, capacity perspective, um, which is a little bit different than seats. Um, so seats will be lower than capacity because of the standing area that, that you mentioned that is becoming increasingly popular, especially with millennials um, and yeah. especially within the premium that most people or a lot of people don't like fixed seats because then I can only talk to the person on my left and on my right. Um, they like areas that they can go mingle uh, with their friends and family, mingle with corporate partners, um, and, and consume the game, uh, in a more free flow area. But for us, getting back to your question, we've been artificially capped, uh, because pre us building stadiums, like we are now, um, we were in kind of USL 1.0 stadiums that were very small. So if you look at like Colorado Springs, for example, they were playing in a 5,000 seat venue that was, I would say in a uh, C minus location within the city. And they were, you know, averaging in the three, 3000 range. And it was very kind of general admission type seating within their old venue. Move to uh, when they moved to their new venue as they are in now, it's in an A plus location. Um, it's in a modern uh, venue. And, you know, we, last week, I think they had 8,000 people. And so it is a function of getting to seeing where we can be in a championship. I think we'll be building in that 7,500 on the low end up to, you know, the 15,000 capacity mark. Again, seats will be lower than that. Um, and then League One, I think we'll be in the, the 5,000 to 10,000 uh, range. And so, but we also really try to think of our stadiums as multi-purpose venues. So in addition to men's professional soccer and women's professional soccer, we also really think about concerts, um, festivals, and all sorts of other uh, events that we can have there. And so, again, we might trade a, a, a permanent stage that we use for group seating, uh, group uh, premium during the soccer match, but then that enables us to have a quicker turnover to a concert the next night. And so it's really optimizing for the market and the, the dynamics and obviously the market sizes are different, but also the dynamics within the market are different, such as, you know, the, um, the degree to which they have uh, open air concert venues. Um, so that changes in every market and that will influence our, um, you know, our design in addition to the overall site constraints um, that, are, that are different per project because we really, if possible, again, like to have a mixed-use development around it, um, which enables the fans to have a great time before the game uh, and, and after the game. You're talking about the league side of things. I'm seeing more and more ownership groups. They need someone like you in their group. They need a real estate expert. It's not just about acquiring a team anymore. It is, again, that bigger development. Are you starting to see that as well when ownership groups put uh, a group together? They're like, we need someone in this group who understands real estate expertise. For sure. So we, a lot of our ownership groups do have either the primary or, or, or one part of their ownership group uh, have someone uh, with a real estate background. The league, depending on the market, um, hopefully has done a lot of the, the groundwork for them uh, to put together the project. And then our, you know, our whole real estate team um, is, of course, available to all of our teams to help them through the process. Um, you know, I say, you know, building a stadium is kind of like a wedding. Like after you do one, uh, you know, you're like, oh, you, know, you figured out all the things that went wrong. <laughs> uh, so, you know, for us after, you know, 10, 15, 20 now, um, I think we have a really unique perspective on it because we get to be part of so many uh, projects that we've done and so many active projects uh, that it's, you know, in, uh, an expertise that I feel like we have a um, unique uh, vantage point on uh, because we're so fortunate to get to work on uh, so many across the country of different sizes and shapes um, and different opportunities and limitations. 
Before I let you go, I want to ask you a little bit about yourself personally. So I read you went to Duke and you played on the, the men's varsity team. So you understand yeah. soccer at a pretty deep level because you played college soccer at Duke. Is that right? So I had the fortune of playing uh, my, my dad, who's our, 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 our CEO, uh, was a really good player. So I had a really good coach and I think I was a good player with a great coach. Um, and then when you look more broadly at our league office, um, a very significant number of our league office played soccer. So we really like to think that we are uh, we we are a player uh, first league. Uh, we understand the game. Um, this isn't, uh, again, our biggest and thing that we're most proud of is we've really helped develop the soccer game by providing, you know, opportunities for players and coaches, uh, to be part of this game that, that we all love. Um, uh, and from Duke, you know, look, and I had a real estate background and I remember, you know, I, I went with my dad to the LA live project, uh, when I was graduating around 2008 and that project was just opening and, and, you know, he said, this is going to be really the future of sports is going to be the stadium entertainment districts. And so that's something that we just really, really leaned in on. And it's been a core part about, uh, of, of our league's growth. And what I think it's, you know, again, it's growth, but sustainable growth, because the, if you look at, you know, the leagues and teams that, that haven't been successful in the United States, whether it's soccer or football or, or other sports, the common denominator in my uh, view has been leagues that have owned and controlled their stadiums and leagues that have been tenants um, and leagues and teams that have been tenants. And so, uh, again, our, our central thesis has been we have to own and control our stadiums uh, because if you don't, it's very, very, very challenging to have sustainable long-term economics. And so we're executing on that. Um, and, you know, we're really proud that we're, I think by far and away from a number perspective, of course, other leagues have, are building larger, uh, more expensive stadiums. Uh, but in terms of number, you know, the, the, uh, the largest stadium builder in, in the world. Um, and that's a really a, a testament of the, I think the, appetite for professional soccer, uh, men's and women's. Now, I think more people uh, from cities, they, they talk about our, our Super League, our women's platform. And I think we have to remind them that we also have a men's, uh, men's league. Uh, and so that's so exciting. Um, it makes the stadiums, you know, we go from 25 dates to 50 dates. Um, so it's more stadium usage. And we have a, we're playing the women's on an international calendar. Um, so you really have this great um, synergy and usage, uh, con continuous usage of the stadium uh, around the year. So it's so exciting. And, you know, again, really grateful to be part of, you know, the growth of the sport uh, in the United States. Justin Papadakis, the COO and chief real estate officer for the United Soccer League, better, what, better known as the USL. Justin, thanks so much. I, I love what you guys are doing. And uh I'll keep tabs on this and uh, good luck with everything. Thanks, Brian.